Hello and welcome to another one of Mr. Deeping Science Lessons. For today's session, you're going to need a book, a pen and a worksheet that you can download in the link below. In your books, I'd like to get down today's title, which is breathing. And for your starter activity, I'd like you to suggest why your left lung is smaller than your right lung. And why then is the smaller lung on this picture on the right hand side? I'm going to put five seconds on the clock. If you need more time, pause the video and when you're finished, we'll go through the answers together. Have you got an answer? So your left lung is smaller because there needs to be space for your heart. The reason why the smaller lung on this picture is on the right hand side is because all anatomical drawings in biology are as if you are looking at somebody else. And when you're looking at somebody else, their right hand side is your left hand side and vice versa. In today's lesson, we're gonna describe the process of inhaling and exhaling. We're gonna explain what happens during breathing using the bell jar model. We're gonna conduct a simple investigation to determine your lung volume and explain how exercise, smoking and asthma can affect gas exchange. So let's look at what happens when you breathe in. The muscles between your ribs, the intercostal muscles contract and that pulls the ribs outwards and upwards. The diaphragm just underneath contracts and moves downwards. This causes the volume in your chest to increase. And because of that, the pressure in your chest is going to decrease. Then air is going to enter the lungs. Now the exact opposite happens when we breathe out. What I'd like you to do is to write down the events that will happen when we breathe out. You're only going to need to change one word per box. I'm going to put five seconds on the clock. And if you need more time, pause the video. And when you finish, we'll go through the answers together. Are we finished? So when you breathe out, the muscles between the ribs relax. That means the ribs are going to move inwards. The diaphragm is going to relax. The diaphragm will move up. The volume of your chest is going to decrease, which means the pressure of your chest is going to increase and air is going to exit the lungs. So now we've described the process of inhaling and exhaling. Now you do not control your lungs. If you look at this bell jar model, the balloons represent your lungs and the rubber at the bottom represents your diaphragm. And when you pull the diaphragm down, you can see that the balloons inflate. It is your control of the intercostal muscles between the rib and the diaphragm which causes your lungs to inflate. So when that diaphragm is pulled down, the space in the jar increases. That means the pressure is going to be decreased. The size of the lungs is going to increase to try and equalize that pressure in the chest and that's going to cause air to enter the lungs, or in this case, the balloons. What I want you to do next is to complete these sentences on the worksheet. If you haven't got a worksheet, don't worry about it. You can write down the sentences and fill in the blanks. If you still need a challenge, I'd also like you to suggest why this bell jar model is not a good model for breathing. I'm going to put five seconds on the clock. If you need more time, pause the video, and when you finish, we'll go through the answers together. Have you got your answer? So starting on the left, when the diaphragm gets pulled down, the space inside your chest increases. The pressure in your chest will decrease. This causes the size of the lungs to increase, and this is called inhalation. Over to the sentences on the right, when the diaphragm gets pushed up, the space inside the chest decreases. The pressure in your chest is going to increase, and this causes the size of the lungs to decrease, and this is called exhalation. Did you suggest why the bell jar model was not a good model for breathing? If you did, I'd like to know about it down in the comments below. So now we can explain what happens during breathing using the bell jar model. Next, we're going to have a look at lung volume, which is a measure of how much air you can fit into your lungs. You can compare your lung volume with other people by using a balloon. You're allowed one breath to blow up the balloon as large as possible. And the amount of air in the balloon is your lung volume. But this isn't considered a good measure of lung volume because at the end of it, we don't get a quantity. We can see it, we get a qualitative value, but we don't get a number at the end of it. So we can't compare it if we come back to the experiment on different days. What we can do instead is we can blow into a bottle of water using a pipe. Now the air that you breathe out is going to displace the water. This then gives us a numerical value for your lung volume, which then makes it far easier to compare your results to somebody else's. What I'd like to do on your worksheet is to calculate the lung volume for these three students. Each student started with 5,000 centimeter cubed in their bottle and it's also got what they finish with at the end. 
You can use the first student's data to practice your calculation. And if you get that 1,800 at the other end, then you got your calculation correct. If you haven't got a worksheet, don't worry about it. You can copy down the table and fill in the blanks. And if you still want to challenge, I'd like to suggest some factors that can increase or decrease your lung volume. I'm going to put five seconds on the clock. If you need more time, pause the video. And when you finish, we'll go through the answers together. Have you got your answer? So let's start with Paul. Paul starts with 5,000 centimeters cubed in his bottle. And at the end of it, it's got 1,600 centimeters cubed. So we're going to do 5,000 minus 1,600 to give us 3,400. For George, we're going to do 5,000 minus 2,600 to give us 2,400. And for Ringo, we're going to do 5,000 minus 2,750 to give us 2,250. Which means the student with the largest lung volume is Paul. Did you have a go at the challenge? If you did, you could compare your answers in our next task because we're going to look at some of those factors which increase and decrease your lung volume. So now we've conducted a simple investigation and looked at the data to help us determine our lung volume. For your next task, what I'd like you to do is to copy this table. It's got three headings, it goes four lines down, and our headings are increased lung capacity, no change, and decreased lung capacity. Once you've completed your table, I want you to put these eight things under the correct heading. And if you want a challenge, I'd like you to suggest who in your family would have the largest lung capacity. And I want you to explain your answer, so you need to give a reason why. I'm going to put five seconds on the clock and if you need more time, pause the video and when you finish, we'll go through the answers together. Have you got your answers? Let's start with being fit. Fitter people generally have larger lung capacities. Overweight people, on the other hand, tend to have lower lung capacities. If you are tall, you tend to have a larger lung capacity than someone who is short. Having asthma actually doesn't affect lung capacity unless you're having an asthma attack. In that case, it goes down. Living on top of a mountain, so living at high altitudes, is actually going to increase your lung capacity because of the change in pressure. And old age and being young have no effect on your lung capacity. As you get older, you do tend to increase in your lung capacity, but that's more to do with you getting taller. So we've looked at how fitness and asthma affects lung volume. But in order to fully complete this learning objective, you're going to need to go back and look at the gas exchange and try and relate that lung volume to effective gas exchange in the lung. So we're really going to give this a little tick for now, but if you think you can link those two ideas together, I'd like to hear about it down in the comments below. So we've got one more task we need to complete before we wrap this lesson up, and you get to choose what to do. You can write a tweet about today's lesson, 140 characters max, and you get to hashtag those keywords. You can write down two correct statements and one incorrect statement about today's lesson, or you can draw the most important thing that you've learned today. I hope you've had a great lesson and I'll see you next time. Thanks for watching the lesson. If you found it useful, don't forget to press the like button. And why don't you subscribe and press the bell icon as well so you know when the next lesson's available. You can also support me on Patreon and you can follow me on Facebook and Twitter and I appreciate all the support. And I'll see you next time.